Charlie Baker, 0405126, U556, Interrogation of Survivors, August 1941, Naval Intelligence Division, Admiralty, SW1. The following report is compiled from information derived from prisoners of war. The statements made cannot always be verified. They should therefore not be accepted as facts unless they are definitely stated to be confirmed by information from other sources. Table of Contents Section 1 Introductory Remarks Section 2 Crew of U-556 3. Early History of U-556 4. First Cruise of U-556 5. Last Cruise of U-556 6. Sinking of U-556 7. Details of U-556 8. U-137 Appendix Crew of U-556. Report of Interrogation of Survivors of U-556 sunk at about 0700 on Friday, 27th June, 1941, in position 60 degrees by 18 north, 29 degrees by 20 west. Section 1. Introductory Remarks. This report on the interrogation of survivors of U-556, a 500-ton U-boat, contains only such information as refers to U-556 and U-137. Some remarks on the latter U-boat was included because she was formerly commanded by the captain of U-556, and his career is thus more easily followed. All general information obtained will be published in the report on the interrogation of prisoners captured at the sinking of U-651. Section 2. Crew of U-556 U-556 carried four officers, 15 chief and petty officers, 24 ratings, and in addition, a sub-lieutenant and a midshipman whose suitability for U-boats was being tested. The total was thus 47 men. One officer, one petty officer, and two ratings lost their lives when the U-boat was sunk, and a third rating died later. The captain, Captain Lieutenant Herbert Wolfog, was considered by the Germans to have been one of their U-boat aces. He was born on 5th June 1915 in Japan, and entered the Navy in 1933. He transferred to U-boats in 1937, and was appointed to his first command in 1940. An earlier statement to the effect that Wolfoth had at one time commanded U-22 could not be confirmed. If he had command of this U-boat, it would only have been for a short time, as he was no longer on board at the end of March 1940. In April or May 1940, he was appointed to command of U-137, a 300-ton U-boat of the same series as U-138, Charlie Baker 405125. Built by the Deutsche Werke, Kiel, some statements regarding U-137 are given in Section 8 of this report. By the time Wolfarf was appointed to command of U-556, he had to his credit sinkings alleged by prisoners to total about 56,000 tons. His activities in U-556 brought his total claims up to 93,977 tons, representing 22 ships, including an escort vessel. On 25th May 1941, Wolfarth was awarded the Knight's Insignia of the Iron Cross. He was extremely security conscious and gave the impression of being a disciplinarian, rather a bully and arrogant. His success had made him conceited, but he showed a certain sense of humor. 
He was adequately educated and reasonably polite, but in conversation he betrayed occasional streaks of callousness and cruelty. He was not married, and his home was in Berlin. He spoke fair English. The first lieutenant, Oberleutnant Sir C. Hans Schaefer, aged 30 years, was a Rhinelander by birth and education. He was married, and his wife lived in Hamburg. He joined the merchant service in 1928 and transferred to the Navy in 1934. He formerly served in the AA Gunnery and Coastal Defense Section. The chief quartermaster expressed his surprise that Schaefer would have so responsible a position as first lieutenant of a U-boat, considering that this officer was only on his second active service cruise. It was admitted, however, that Schaefer was an exceptionally efficient officer, and that possibly that fact justified the risk. Had he returned safely from U-556's last cruise, he would have been appointed to a course for prospective U-boat captains, lasting f a few weeks, and would have been given the command of a U-boat of his own, according to the chief quartermaster. The junior officer, Leutnant Sir C. Hans Suvart, 22 years of age, came from western Germany, joined the Navy in October 1937, and transferred to U-boats fairly recently. He was the most arrogant survivor of U-556, and based his confident pronouncements regarding the war on German invincibility. He welcomed the war against Russia as a further duty of the German nation in the crusade for the establishment of Hitler's new order, under which the subject and abject nations would be shown by the Herrenvolk how to live. The engineer officer, Oberleutnant Engineer Lieutenant Kroner, lost his life when U-556 was sunk. He joined the Navy in 1935. Lieutenant Sir C. Frank Rolink, aged 28 years, was carried in U-556 on her last cruise to determine his suitability for the U-boat service. He was a Westphalian and single, but engaged to a girl from his native village. At the age of 20, he joined the Navy on the lower deck and, after two years, became a cadet. He served in the pocket battleship Deutschland during the Spanish Civil War. His last appointment before joining U-556 was recruiting officer at Murvik at Scholzwig holstein His family were wealthy brewers, and Rolink was quite well-educated, had pleasant manners, was not as thoroughly drilled in security matter as the other prisoners, and was altogether a more human type. The midshipman, Fenrik Zersi, Felix Urbanski, also being tested for U-boat service, was a 19-year-old Viennese who had been educated at a national political training establishment, Nationalpolitische Erzehungsanstalt, a new type of school introduced soon after the Anschluss. The object of such establishments is to provide free education from the age of 10 up to the abitur examination, usually taken at about 18 years of age, for suitable sons of poor parents. Special emphasis is laid out on mental and physical toughening in the spirit of National Socialism. More attention is paid to games than in most high schools, but sport is not allowed to interfere with political instruction. A form of enlightenment considered to be of paramount importance and imparted by the headmaster with reverent quotations from Mein Kampf. Pupils chosen for these schools are those intended for military or technical careers. The object aimed at is the increase in numbers of tough and militant Nazis in the fighting forces and in the professions. Urbanski joined the Navy at the outbreak of war and, after some preliminary training, served in a minesweeper for several months. He had not yet had any U-boat training at all, and admitted that, had he been considered suitable for U-boat service, such training would have been hasty and inadequate. 
He was an ardent Nazi, not intelligent, poorly educated, gauche, and scarcely suitable to have become an officer. He professed contempt for the masses of the German people whom he thought stupid and gullible. The chief and petty officers included a very few trained and experienced men who had previously served in U-137 under Wolfhard, but most petty officers were men of limited experience who had been hastily promoted after inadequate promotion courses. Discontent with their lot and with the lack of prospects was coupled with criticism not so much of their own officers as of the naval authorities, service conditions, and what they considered the absence of realization on the part of higher authorities of the conditions and requirements of the lower deck. The ratings were the usual propaganda-fed sheep-like Nazis of about 19 to 22 years of age. Many were typical products of the Hitler Jugend organization, had joined the Navy because they had been attracted by clever propaganda and had been drafted without option to U-boats. Some were men of poor brain and had lived the simplest peasant lives until they found themselves almost to their surprise in the Navy. The petty officers were extremely critical of these recruits and expressed much apprehension as to the results to be feared from entrusting work of any importance to such men. There seemed to be an atmosphere of suppressed anxiety and an incipient fear which they themselves could not define. On the other hand, most men expressed satisfaction with the internal state of their country and were not anxious about their families. They had great faith in the government care of the civilian population, and this feeling of security of their relatives and homes helped largely to keep their morale at a high level and compensated for their personal grievances. Section 3. Early History of U-556 U-556 was built by Blom and Voss Hamburg. Prisoners were unable to state when she was laid down. In September 1940, the first members of the crew were drafted to stand by the U-boat during the final stages of construction. While the U-boat was still on the slips, the crew was not allowed on board, but received theoretical instruction in the Gottenwind, formerly a sailing training ship. Some engine room ratings were first sent to a special course of four weeks at Modernwerke Mannheim before being sent to the Blom and Voss yard. The U-boat was said to have been launched during the first or second week of December 1940. During that month and January 1941, most of the crew joined and U-556 was commissioned on 6th February 1941. During this period, the crew lived in barracks in Steinwerder, according to prisoners. She started her acceptance trials in 17th February, proceeding through the Kiel Canal to the Baltic. It was stated that U-556 carried out her trials alone and visited Gottenhafen, among other places. She returned to Kiel in April 1941 to be prepared for her first cruise. The captain was Wolfart, the engine officer was Körner, the first lieutenant was Schaefer, and the junior officer was Zuvard. Section 4. First Cruise of U-556 It was established that U-556 left on her first war cruise in the morning of 1st May 1941 and proceeded through the Kiel Canal. She was stated to have been in company with U-67 Captain Lieutenant Blechroth, which was proceeding to a dockyard at Wilhelmshaven. U-556 proceeded to the north of the British Isles into the Atlantic. Two spare torpedoes were said to have been carried in the containers on the upper deck, in addition to five torpedoes in the tubes and five in reserve. Prisoners admitted that they sank by gunfire a three-masted schooner north of the Faroes, the ship was described as a guard ship and as having been shelled from a great distance. The date was given as about a week after leaving Germany. 
i.e. about 7th May 1941. The Germans stated that their first shell hit and put out of action the sailing ship's gun, and that U-556 fired 23 shells before the ship sank. NID Note The ship was the unarmed Faroese fishing trawler Emmanuel of 166 tons. She was sunk at 2300 on 6th May, just west of the island of Muginés. The crew consisted of eight men, of whom three were killed. This revolting incident of the sinking of a harmless Faroese fishing trawler is described by Wolfarth in an interview which was broadcast from Germany on the 5th June 1941. Wolfarth said, The other interesting experience was the right at the beginning of our trip. I was suddenly disturbed by a patrol boat. It was dusk, and I surfaced near her and attacked her with my gun. The patrol boat of only 500 tons was set alight after some five minutes fire during which we expended some 30 rounds of ammunition. She was fully ablaze. It was a most beautiful sight to see her burning in the dusk. She had also a gun on board, but it seems that our first round put it out of action. These 500 tons were at least something to speak of, or we would have been forced to return with bad luck. It gave us a better feeling for the beginning of our cruise. Thus Wolfart described the murder of three inoffensive Faroese fishermen. The next victim was said to have been an independent freighter of about 5,000 tons sunk by one torpedo about four days later. The cruise was then uneventful, according to prisoners, until about 21st May 1941, when U-556 sank by torpedo five or six ships in a convoy within a short space of time. One of U-556 victims was described as a 3,000-ton ship sunk by gunfire, the U-boat having fired 101 rounds at her. A petty officer stated that not more than three ships were sunk on any one day. Several prisoners gave the number of ships sunk on this cruise as eight, including one tanker, and added that the U-boat was not attacked at all. The total tonnage claimed for the cruise was 49,000 tons. On 23rd May 1941, the German radio announced that unspecified U-boats had sunk 70,900 tons of shipping, including tankers of 8,000 to 10,000 tons and 13,000 tons, as well as an ammunition ship of 7,000 tons. The broadcast added that Wolfart and Gusset had particularly distinguished themselves. Captain Lieutenant Gusset is known to command U-98. NID Note The following ships of convoy Howe X-ray 126 were sunk on 20th May 1941 in approximate position 56 degree to 58 degree north and 41 degrees west. Norman Monarch 4,718 tons Harpagus 5,173 tons Cacaponset 5,996 tons. Darlington Court, 4,979 tons. British Security a Tanker, 8,470 tons. Rothermere, 5,356 tons. John D. Peterson, Tanker, 6,128 tons. On 21st May 1941, the tanker Elusa, 6,237 tons, was sunk in position 58 degrees by 53 north, 39 degrees by 45 west. It is believed that these ships are those referred to in the exaggerated German claim of 23rd May 1941. On 25th May 1941, the German radio announced that Wolfart had been awarded the knight insignia of the Iron Cross. 
the chief quartermaster, stated that on 26th May 1941, when on the way back to Lorient, U-556 received orders from the Admiral U-boats to turn round and proceed towards Bismarck and to stand by the battleship. Prisoner said that U-556 obeyed and reached the vicinity of Bismarck at some time on 26th May. The U-boat was on the surface within sight of Bismarck during the night of 26th, 27th May. Prisoners claimed to have approached submerged to within 800 meters, or 874 yards, of HMS King George V and HMS Ark Royal, but having no torpedoes left, were powerless to attack them. They added that at that time, they saw no destroyers protecting the warships. The quartermaster of U-556 stated that King George V passed within 200 meters, 218 yards, of the U-boat submerged to periscope. Later, the U-boat surfaced and reported by wireless telegraph the position on the German squared chart of Bismarck and King George V and a British aircraft carrier. She also gave their course. U-556 continued to report the position in the hope that other U-boats would arrive on the scene or that aircraft would be sent to bomb the British warships. Prisoners said that the battle started with renewed violence early in the morning of 27th May and destroyers were sighted. At 0600, U-556 met U-74, Captain Lieutenant Kentrat, as U-556 had no torpedoes left, except the two in the containers on the upper deck, which could not be loaded into the U-boat because of the rough weather. And as she was running short of fuel oil, she told U-74 that she was forced to make for Lorient without any further delay. She then submerged and proceeded. Wolfart knew that U-74 had three torpedoes left, but had been damaged by a depth charge attack and could not dive, but he believed that other U-boats were in the vicinity. Wolfart had already used his motors on the surface in order to save as much fuel as possible and feared that if he continued to stand by, he would exhaust either his fuel oil and would then be unable to make port or would deplete his batteries and be unable to escape submerged. He professed to have been unable to approach near enough to Bismarck to take off any of her crew, although he believed that he would have been able to rescue 200 men. NID note. Other U-boat officer prisoners considered that he would not have been able to take on board more than about 150 men from Bismarck. U-556 on her homeward journey surfaced again at about 1100 on the day in question, according to the chief quartermaster, and received a further message from Admiral U-Boats ordering her to take off Bismarck's war diary and bring it back to German naval authorities. This message was a repetition of the ones transmitted earlier, but not received, as U-556 was proceeding submerged but by this time the U-boat was far away from Bismarck and had only four tons of fuel oil remaining. The quartermaster persuaded the captain not to attempt to carry out the order, as the remaining supply of fuel would have been insufficient. This prisoner used the additional argument that the handing over of Bismarck's war diary would have a bad effect on the morale of the battleship's crew, who might have felt that they were doomed and were apparently being abandoned to their fate by the German Admiralty. Thus, U-556 continued her homeward journey and arrived at Lorient on 30th May 1941 with only 80 liters of fuel oil remaining. Various members of the crew received iron crosses, and some of the men went for a week's holiday at Karnak. The U-boat was said to have undergone a general overhaul, but did not go into a dry dock. Some repairs to the cooling system were carried out, but later proved to have been unsatisfactorily done. In discussing the performance of the U-boat during the first cruise, 
Prisoners said that they had experienced constant difficulties with the diesels, the cylinder heads, and the jets being unsatisfactory. The repairs at Lorient took some time as the engines were lacking in compression. It was rumored that the U-boat was to proceed to the South Atlantic on her next cruise, and a wireless telegraph petty officer stated that he was issued with special wireless telegraph books for that purpose, but the latter orders were apparently changed. Some members of the crew left U-556 at Lorient and were replaced. Rolink and Urbanski joined the U-boat shortly before the beginning of the second and last cruise. Section 5. Last Cruise of U-556 U-556 was said to have left Lorient on 19th June 1941 on her last cruise. Prisoners added that she was not escorted out of the port. It was stated that five torpedoes were carried in the tubes and five reserves inside the U-boat, but prisoners did not know whether or not two more torpedoes were carried in the upper deck containers. When west of Brest, the U-boat received a signal to the effect that U-552, Oberleutnant zur See Erich Top, was setting out on a cruise. The cruise was uneventful until U-556 met U-552, which seems to have been about 23rd or 24th June. It seems that U-552 had received information about a convoy, but had not been able to find it. Wolfart and Top arranged that the latter should proceed towards the east. After patrolling the area for a while, Wolfart calculated that the convoy could not be very far off. U-556 then proceeded on a zigzag course to the west and on 25th June located and followed the convoy. During the night of 25th 26th June, the U-boat proceeded on the surface most of the time, approaching to within 2,000 meters of the convoy and only dived for long enough to listen on her hydrophones. These tactics were repeated eight or nine times during the night. On the 26th June, U-556 continued to follow the convoy and was joined by Oberleutnant zur See Reinhard Sorens' U-boat, stated by prisoners to have been U-564. U-562 Oberleutnant Zersi Kohlmann and a fourth U-boat also arrived on the scene. U-556, obeying signals from the Admiral U-boats, continued to transmit the position by wireless telegraph in order to guide still more U-boats, believed to have been operating in the area, to assist in an attack on the convoy. Prisoners stated that U-562 came near to U-556 about midnight on 26 June, and Coleman and Wolfart spoke to each other. Then U-556 went ahead of the convoy and lay in wait. During the night, 26-27 June 1941, the crew of U-556 claimed to have seen the blowing up of a 12,000-ton petrol tanker torpedoed by another U-boat. NID note, the convoy was Howe X-ray 133. Two tankers were torpedoed on the night in question, namely the Dutch Tibia, 10,356 tons in position 59 degrees 55 north, 30 degrees 49 west, and the Norwegian Kongsvard, 9,467 tons in position 60 degree north, 30 degrees 42 west. Both of these tankers subsequently reached port. The next morning, 27th June, was misty and the U-boat dived to listen on her hydrophones. She heard the sound of ships, surfaced at once, and followed in the direction of the sounds. The mist cleared suddenly and U-556 sighted the convoy almost on top of her. She dived at once and ran in to attack with all her tubes ready to fire. 
U-556 made her last signal at 0400 German time, presumably just before she dived. Section 6. Sinking of U-556 The Germans believed that a Sunderland flying boat sighted the submerged U-boat and reported it to the British hunting squadron, described as consisting of three gunboats escorting the convoy from Canada. Prisoners added that these ships were only just ahead of the U-boat. NID Note a Sunderland flying boat reported sighting a U-boat at 23.30 on 26 June in position 59 degrees 32 north, 29 degrees 55 west. At about 0600 on 27th June 1941, HMS Nasturtium gained a contact on the port side of the convoy and was joined at once by HMS Selendine. The position was that Nasturtium had a contact but few depth charges, while Selendine had a plentiful supply of depth charges but no contact. After expending all her own depth charges, therefore, Nasturtium led Selendine in close order over the U-boat, giving her a signal when to fire. Several attacks were carried out in this manner, although Selendine never established contact. Gladiolus was present for the latter part of the hunt, but only established contact in time to make two attacks, after damage had already been inflicted on U-556 by the other corvettes. U-556, having dived as quickly as possible, was at the depth of 70 meters, or 230 feet, when the first depth charge attack took place. The Germans stated that six depth charges were dropped on that occasion and caused very serious leaks. Some water entered and the boat went deeper to what was stated to have been 130 meters, 426.5 feet. One wireless telegraph petty officer said that he smashed the cipher machine, M. Schossel, immediately after this first attack in accordance with instructions laid down. The other wireless telegraph petty officer insisted that it was he who smashed the cipher machine towards the end of the action. Later, the increasing quantity of water in the after part of the U-boat short-circuited the starboard motor, and the port motor had to be switched on again, despite the noise. The Germans blamed this noise to a large extent for their capture. They claimed that Fifty-four depth charges were dropped on them during a period over five hours. The midshipman stated that after the fifth depth charge attack, two men came into the control room and demanded that the U-boat should surface, but that he drove them back to their action stations with his revolver. Some of the crew stated that the last depth charge attack exploded a torpedo inside the U-boat and killed two men. Others professed not to know of this incident, but stated that at one stage of the action, water poured in through the after tube. Extensive damage had been caused in U-556, and the starboard motor, though still running, was becoming overheated, and the quantity of water shipped was extremely serious, and much valuable compressed air had been used to work the pumps, so that only 30 to 40 kilograms remained in the bottles. The lighting system had failed earlier in the action, but the emergency lighting system worked well. Various parts inside the U-boat had been painted with phosphorescent paint to help their crew to find their way about. Wolfarth decided to go to the periscope depth in order, if possible, to torpedo one of the British warships and then try to escape on the surface, as the diesels had not been put out of action. But the U-boat rose at a great speed, and on surfacing it was found that the attacking ships were in positions which excluded any chance of an attack by the U-boat being successful. As U-556 surfaced, Gladiolus was running in to make a second attack with her last remaining depth charges. One charge from the port thrower actually fell on the after part of the U-boat, 
but in the general noise and splashes of shells, Gladiolus and the other two ships having at once opened fire, it was not noticed whether it eventually exploded or not. Prisoners stated that one shell penetrated the conning tower, killing one man. The crew immediately abandoned ship, and the engineer officer and a petty officer opened all vents in order to ensure the sinking of the U-boat. A petty officer was loud in his criticisms of some of the senior engine room petty officers. He said that they fought to be the first to escape from the U-boat and turned deaf ears to a wounded man who was calling for help. Other men tried to help the wounded man who had had three fingers shot off, but in vain, and he was ultimately drowned. The British ships ceased fire as soon as it was seen that the Germans were abandoning ship. The engineer officer and three men lost their lives. The rest of the complement was rescued, but one man died later of potash poisoning caused by allowing water to get into his escape apparatus and then breathing the resultant gas. The U-boat remained afloat, slowly sinking for about one hour and efforts to prevent her sinking proved in vain. The position was 060 degrees 18 north, 029 degrees 20 west. Both officers and men denied with every appearance of sincerity all suggestion that they had ever put into any Icelandic port and that they had ever been in communication with any German agents in Iceland or Greenland they had no knowledge whatsoever regarding British dispositions in Iceland, nor of German agents in that country. They professed to have had no instructions as to whom to contact in Iceland in case of need, and denied that U-556 had sent no meteorological reports to Germany from the Icelandic area. Section 7 Details of U-556 General Remarks U-556 was one of the newer type of 500-ton U-boats. She was built by Blom and Voss, Hamburg. The crew were enthusiastic in their tributes to the powers of resistance to attack shown by U-556. The chief mechanician believed that the pressure hull was 12 millimeters, or 0.4 72 inches thick. This statement should be treated with reserve. The aperture through which the diesels and all large units of machinery were passed while the U-boat was under construction was closed, riveted, and welded. Formerly, riveting only was considered sufficient, but had not proved so, and recently welding has also been done. Prisoners stated that it was planned to reopen this aperture every two years during a major refit. U-556 was said to have had four bow and one stern torpedo tubes, and to have had two upper deck containers for the stowage of two additional spare torpedoes. U-556 was said to be 70 meters or 229.6 feet long. She was painted a uniform gray and not camouflaged, according to prisoners. The upper deck was described as being covered with wooden planking which extended from a line 2 meters, 6.5 feet, abaft the bow to within 3 quarter meters, 2.46 feet, of the stern. Prisoners stated that a small wooden dinghy was stowed in the superstructure between the pressure hull and the upper deck. It was implied that U-556 had various improvements and new fittings not included in older 500-ton U-boats. Very little confirmation was obtained on this score, and implications were thought to have been intentionally misleading and often made in a spirit of defiance. Diesel Engines, Electric Motors, and Speeds U-556 was said to have been fitted with two Deutsche Cologne diesel engines of 1,400 horsepower each and two brown Bovary electric motors. U-556 speeds 
were given as utmost speed on surface Alcesta craft 16.8 knots three quarter speed on surface Grosse Fart 14 knots half speed on surface Halbe Fart 10 knots slow speed on surface Langsam Fart 7 to 8 knots cruising speed on surface Marche Fart 6 to 7 knots dead slow speed on surface Kleines Fart 5 knots utmost speed submerged 6 to 7 knots cruising speed submerged 2 knots dead slow speed submerged less than 1 knot drive between engines and motors it was stated that no geared drive was fitted between engines and motors or between motors and shaft the clutch was said to be a friction clutch operated automatically or by hand air compressor some engine room personnel was sent to the Junkers works at Munich at various dates to study the new type of air compressors fitted in U556. This new type was said to save considerable electric current. Tanks U556 was said to have had a pair of saddle tanks. Each saddle tank was described as having been divided into three parts, the forward part being the trimming tank, the central part the main diving tank and the after part another diving tank the latter was also used for fuel oil prisoners said that there were no other diving tanks inside or outside the pressure hull no confirmation was obtained of this statement a fuel oil tank was stated to have been fitted inside the pressure hull the chief mechanician said u556 could carry 108 cubic meters of fuel oil and three and a half cubic meters of lubricating oil guns prisoners stated that one 8.8 .8 centimeter gun was carried forward of the conning tower and one 20 millimeter gun on the conning tower that the guns crews and ammunition passed up through the conning tower emergency floats Prisoners confirmed some earlier statements to the effect that the emergency floats are made of sailcloth. It is presumed that there is an opening to let in seawater, as it is known that water acting on chemicals inside the float causes it to become inflated. Prisoners believe that there is a self-sealing valve. Device U-556 formerly had an upturned thumb painted on the conning tower as a badge, but this had lately been painted over when U-556 was repainted and had not been replaced. On entering port, Wolfart hoisted a large model of this thumb on the top of the periscope. Wireless Telegraph Prisoners stated that U-556 carried an extensible aerial which could be raised to a height of 13 meters 42.6 feet above the conning tower when the u-boat was proceeding at periscope depth the receiving and transmitting apparatus was described as being inside the u-boat and capable of rotating through an angle of 90 degrees in either direction only the wireless telegraph petty officers were permitted to transmit wireless telegraph messages wireless telegraph ratings being allowed to transmit only if no petty officer was available by reason of illness. Four-hour watches were said to have been kept on HF and MF, two men being on duty at a time. Diesel Foundations Prisoners stated that no anti-shock device was fitted to the diesel foundations as a means of lessening the shock of depth charge explosions. Section 8, U-137 Before his appointment to the command of U-556, Wolfhard had commanded U-137. Prisoners who had served in U-137 
stated that she was in the final stages of construction when they joined her on May 1940 at the Deutsche Werk Kiel. While she was still on the slips, she was said to have been completed on 23rd June 1940. The first lieutenant was Oberleutnant zur See Gerhard Massmann, and the engineer officer was Oberleutnant Engineer Lieutenant Junk. Wolfhardt was stated to have made three cruises in U-137, the first having been in September 1940, when four ships totaling 28,000 tons were alleged to have been sunk from a convoy. It was added that this cruise, which started at Kiel and ended at Lorient, took about three weeks. On 27th September 1940, the German High Command claimed that a small U-boat under Wolfarth had sunk four steamers totaling 23,000 tons, one of the ships having been a tanker. This tonnage was corrected in a subsequent broadcast two months later to 23,800 tons. The second cruise, also about three weeks duration, beginning at Lorient, was said to have been carried out during October and early November 1940. Prisoners claimed to have sunk an auxiliary cruiser of 18,000 tons, but no other ships. The victim was described as a former liner of the Bibby Line of Liverpool. NID Note HMS Cheshire 10,600 tons, formerly a ship of the Bibby Line of Liverpool, was torpedoed at 2030 on the 14th October 1940, in position 55 degrees 10 north, 13 degrees 25 west, 270 degrees, bloody foreland, 177 miles. They said that they were at sea when U-32 sank SS Empress of Britain on 26th October 1940 and that they sighted an empty lifeboat from that ship. U-137 was stated to have tried to reach the area in which Empress of Britain had been reported damaged by aircraft and on fire, but to have been too late to take any useful action in the sinking. Prisoners stated that U-137 then proceeded to Bergen and hinted that she had some special mission of which they did not know the nature. Some prisoners said that the U-boat then returned to Lorient. On 20th November 1940, the German radio announced that Wolfhard's small U-boat had increased her total sinkings to 61,500 tons. This, coupled with the correction of the tonnage claimed on the first cruise, indicated that the official figure for the sinkings on the second cruise was 37,700 tons, or 19,000 tons more than claimed by prisoners. The third cruise was said to have been the least successful and seems to have been carried out soon after the second cruise, probably during December 1940. Some prisoners stated that U-137 operated very close to the west coast of Scotland and north of Ireland. Other prisoners claimed that the U-boat operated in a northern channel. Three fast ships proceeding independently were said to have been sunk, their total tonnage amounting to about 14,000 tons. NID Note It is considered possible that one of the ships referred to may have been merchant vessel Rotorua, 10,000 890 tons, a straggler from the convoy Howe X-Ray 92, sunk at 1339 on the 11th December 1940, in position 58 degrees 56 north, 11 degrees 20 west. U-137 returned to Kiel at the end of this cruise. According to prisoners, Wolfart's sinking then totaled about 56,000 tons. But a German broadcast at a later date stated that in his small U-boat, this officer had sunk 18 ships amounting 75,477 tons, 
this figure is almost 20,000 tons more than that quoted by prisoners who actually made all three cruises. NID Note A subsequent broadcast on 25th May 1941 reduced Wolfarth's claim in respect of his first cruise in U-556, thus bringing his grand total at that date to approximately the same as that quoted by prisoners. Q-137 is believed to have returned to Kiel at about the end of December 1940, and Wolfart was then appointed to U-1556. He took a number of his men with him to his new U-boat. The first lieutenant of U-137, Massmann, was said to have succeeded to the command of the U-boat. Prisoners had no information regarding the subsequent activities of U-137, and Massmann has not yet been mentioned in German High Command communiques, nor in any broadcast. He is known to have been in Berlin on 10th April 1941. Appendix Crew of U-556 List of survivors Etc. Officers 5 Petty officers 14 Men 21 Total 40 5 casualties Total crew Officers 6 Petty officers 15 Men 24 Total 45